good evening and uh, welcome to another one of our uh, Facebook Live uh, broadcasts. Uh, I think it's our fourth one. And tonight we're uh, going to be uh, doing this from uh, three different locations. So uh, we're crossing our fingers and hoping for the best here. Um, but listen, I, I hope you're all uh, getting uh, by well in this uh, unusual time. I know that you've all been watching uh, the news and uh, staying updated on different reports from federal and provincial and from local and municipal um, governments and spokespeople in our area. So uh, the aim of tonight is uh, to really talk about some of the programs and the federal side of the various programs that are there to help uh, people and hopefully answer some questions along that lines. So uh, just a brief overview for tonight's um, broadcast. We're going to, I'm going to, uh, we're going to deal with one particular topic and that is the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. It's a, a program that has had the greatest reach across our uh, riding, uh, bar none. Um, of course, there's a whole suite of programs to help workers and businesses, but this is the one that is causing the most um, interest at our office. Um, where I, it'll take about 15 minutes uh, for me to kind of go over, and my and Curtis is going to help me with this as well, just to give you an idea of uh, some of the ins and outs of what we call a uh, CERB or the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, and then uh, we'll go to your questions. So uh, just to give you a bit of a primer on how we do the questions there, I'm going to flip over to Curtis. Uh, he'll give you an idea on how that should work, and then uh, we'll get back and start into the program. Curtis. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, as with our previous town halls, there will be a Q&A session towards the end. If you do have any questions throughout the broadcast, uh, please add them to the chat in the uh, window below. Um, definitely, if they're about CERB, great. If you have questions that aren't related to CERB, please feel free to submit those as well. Uh, just as a reminder, please keep your questions as brief as possible and ensure you're not including any personal information. This broadcast is being recorded, so if we don't get to your question during the town hall, we will follow up afterwards. And we'll go back over to Bruce. Thanks very much, Curtis. And alors, nous pouvons poser votre question en français ou en anglais. Uh, certainement, j'accueille uh, les, les interventions ou les questions ou les commentaires en français. Uh, although we haven't had any uh, French questions yet, so we're, we're hoping that that might happen. And uh, we'll uh, maybe think in the future for one of these broadcasts, uh, perhaps a guest that might help us out with some of that as well. So um, let's get uh, to our main topic tonight, which is the Canada Response Benefit. As I mentioned, this is a program that more than 7.5 million Canadians have applied for and are now getting benefits on. If you do the math on that, what that means here in Simcoe North is probably more than 20,000 people in our riding of approximately 108,000 people, 20,000 people are uh, potentially accessing or applying for that benefit. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ins and outs of that. As I've said, um, I'm talking about this, uh, I, I decided to go with this topic tonight because it really has by far been the, no, the, the highest number of in, inquiries and questions about the program in that regard. So uh, we'll get into the uh, some of the basics on this and then we'll talk a bit about some of the eligibility and the rules around uh, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit CERB. So the key thing is uh, right out of the gate, it is a, a program uh, for people who have lost their work uh, because of COVID-19. Businesses have shut down, so people, for example, who uh, are either sick with COVID-19 and they don't have any paid leave, if they were quarantined and caring for someone who's sick with COVID-19, if they're working parents uh, at home uh, without pay because they're caring for children who are sick or are out of school because schools are closed, uh, workers who are employed but uh, don't have sufficient hours to really sustain their employment, or in the case where an employer may have asked you not to come to work. All of these are uh, scenarios where the CERB will respond. About two weeks after they launched the CERB, they made some changes to the rules. And that uh, is, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Initially, you had to have absolutely no employment whatsoever to get on CERB. They've now allowed uh, that you can have up to about $1,000 of earnings within a four week period and still collect uh, the CERB. Uh, how, is, how easy is it to, uh, to apply? Uh, the main thing is, of course, you have to, uh, if you can get on ahead and get a, a MyCRA account, you'll need that to apply for CERB. 
and it requires you as an applicant to apply every four weeks. You can get up to a maximum of 16 weeks or four four-week periods in CERB, but every four weeks you have to apply again. So you'll have to go to your MyCRA account, fill out the form again, and if you're eligible, then the money will come. If you're getting a, a paycheck, uh, you, know, you can get it either as a, a direct deposit, which will come in a matter of days after you finish the application, or your check uh, can also come in the mail. Uh, the area around the, uh, when you go to apply, the, the CERB website has some good information as to which days make sense for you to apply uh, for each of those four week uh, periods. It should be noted that uh, there are no deductions taken from your check. So it's $500 a week for four weeks, that's $2,000. They won't take any deductions off that 2,000, but you should keep in mind when you go to finish, uh, file your taxes for 2020 calendar year, uh, all of your income that comes to you from CERB will be uh, part of your taxable income when it comes to tax time. Now I'm going to turn over to Curtis to uh, drill down on a little bit of the uh, more detailed information around eligibility. Curtis, go ahead. Thanks, Bruce. So in order to be eligible for the CERB benefit, um, you do need to meet the following conditions. So the first is you um, did not apply nor receive CERB or EI benefits from Service Canada for the same eligibility period that you are applying for. Um, you can have quit your job voluntarily. You do need to reside in Canada and be at least 15 years old. You do need to have earned $5,000, and this needs to be before tax in the last 12 months or in the 2019 tax year. And it can be from any of the following sources. So that would be employment income or self-employment income, and that would include dividend income um, or from provincial benefit payments related to maternity or parental leave or employment insurance. Additionally, your, your work hours must have been reduced because of COVID-19 for any of the following reasons. You have to have stopped or will stop working because of COVID-19. You're unable to work because of COVID-19, for example, because you are taking care of someone who is sick or a dependent. Your regular EI benefits have run out, and this can be any time between December 29th, 2019 to October 3rd, 2020. Now, as Bruce mentioned earlier, there is a new change to the CERB program that does allow you to make some earnings while still collecting the CERB benefit. Um, so if you are applying for the first time, um, you have to have stopped or will stop working or you're working reduced hours due to COVID-19 and you don't expect to earn over a thousand dollars and that will be before tax in employment or self-employment income for at least 14 days in a row during the four week period. If you are applying for a subsequent period, so this would mean that you've already applied for CERB at some point, you will need to be in a situation where you are not working or you're working reduced hours due to COVID-19 and don't expect to earn over $1,000 in employment or self-employment income. And you expect this to continue during that entire four week period. Um, that is it for the eligibility conditions and now we'll pass it back over to Bruce. Thanks very much, Curtis. Now, one of the things that we've come across in relation to CERB is how it actually mixes with other programs, in particular EI. There was a lot of confusion at the early uh, in the early days of CERB in sort of mid to late March and early April when CERB uh, started to open up, is how it would mix with EI. So I've got a few rules on this that uh, I can just describe for you that should be able to um, put that in in a in a place where you can at least understand how it mixes with the EI program. A key date to remember is March 15th. So March 15th of 2020 is kind of the, um, the, the, the sort of the key pivot point for which program is going to apply to you. Uh, so if you were eligible, for example, for EI prior to March 15th, uh, your claim will have been processed uh, through the I e EI system and you'll receive EI benefits. However, if you became EI eligible after March 15th, that claim is going to be processed through the CERB rules and that will put you on the $500 a week or $2,000 a month, uh, 2000 for a four week period. Now, anyone who was already receiving uh, EI benefits prior to March 15th, those benefits are going to continue. Uh, people on that should not apply to CERB. 
Uh, but if your benefits end, if they're scheduled to end before the 3rd of October of 2020, you'll be able to apply for the CERB um, after that point. So would, if your EI, say, is scheduled to finish in mid-June or something like that, you'll be able to carry on, stay on EI till that point and then apply for CERB and then be able to carry on. Of course, presumably that you don't have employment to go back to. So that's a, that's a key thing. Uh, one of the uh, issues around the EI and, and CERB mix, uh, particularly related to expectant mothers. Um, there was, and I'll explain this, it gets a little bit complicated here, but uh, what happened uh, for expectant mothers uh, who had lost their jobs before March 15th um, should have been, uh, if they lost uh, lost their employment for whatever reason before March 15th, they'd be eligible for EI regular benefits. And those that were prior to March 15th, they'll be on EI and they can continue to stay on EI until uh, they transition to EI maternity and paternity benefits after the birth of their child. And that uh, that's under the normal EI rules. But an expectant mother who lost their job after March 15th should be receiving the CERB benefit and that's up to a maximum of 16 weeks. And that will uh, then transition to regular EI after that 16 weeks, either regular EI or maternity and paternity benefits, uh, paternal benefits rather, uh, through until the birth of their child. Uh, when CERB first launched, um, we, we had some issues with the, the fact that applicants that were going to the site uh, were asked if uh, if they were pregnant and anticipating going on maternity benefits. That question was there to help the CERB program uh, transition to a point when that uh, person would be going on to uh, maternity benefits. And there was a, a limitation in the system that unfortunately caused all kinds of glitches. Uh, and what happened was uh, if they checked that box, even after March 15th, if they checked that box, they would be put on the EI system instead of being put on CERB. So this has caused uh, untold problems for many people in our riding. Um, and so that uh, we've just received notice this week that that is going to be corrected. And here's how that's going to work. Starting tomorrow, um, expectant mothers who should have been receiving CERB as opposed to EI will have their claims uh, converted retroactively to the CERB. And so that will mean that uh, all of that is going to um, uh, switch over. Uh, it'll happen uh, automatically within the system. And the weeks for which uh, expectant mothers uh, collect the CERB uh, will not, not have any impact on the number of weeks that they will be entitled to for their maternity and uh, parental benefits. So we hope that that's going to clear a lot of that up. Of course, um, viewers should be encouraged if this is something that they happen to find themselves in, please call our offices and we'd be happy to help with that. There's one other program that we um, find that intermixes with CERB and that is the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. Now the wage subsidy didn't even start to become available until several weeks after the CERB was already in place. But people should know that let's say you're on CERB and you get a call from your employer to come uh, back to work, they have work for you or they want to put you on the wage subsidy. Um, you need to know that for the period, the eligibility period that your CERB has already been paid, you can't be getting a wage subsidy payment during that same four-week period. So you can certainly do that after your four-week period is ended, no problem. Uh, you, if you decide to go back to work and your employer can give you that 75% uh, of regular pay, uh, that's all good. But you want to make sure that that wage subsidy isn't landing in the same four week period that you've already got a CERB payment for. And if for some reason that you end up getting overpaid on these, the CERB website has a, a good explanation of what you do if you're overpaid. And we, we certainly recommend that people do that. Uh, don't get caught in a situation where you've, uh, you've been overpaid. Try to get that corrected. There's a number of different reasons that that might happen. Uh, you may end up with, say, more than $1,000 in earnings in a four-week period, and that makes you ineligible, so you need to send some money back. 
you could have applied for CERB and, and then later found out that you weren't eligible for it. Or some people have even had uh, two identical checks of $2,000 for the same period, one from Service Canada and one from uh, Canada Revenue from CRA. Uh, when that happens, uh, the department will contact you to get that sorted out. Uh, if, on the other hand, if you had two payments of different amounts, you should assume that those payments are accurate. So it could be some to do with Service Canada and some to do with CERB around that uh, transition time. So I hope that you uh, find that helpful. As I say, when you go to the My Canada, uh, My CRA account or through the, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit uh, page on the website, there's some good instructions in there, but we're here to help you too if you have any questions with that. And just a final thing before we go to questions, we we had uh, we do have have had reports of some scams out there. Um, you know, here we have a very important program helping people out with income support, and there are people trying to exploit that. So, people, if you get a text or an email that says, you know, collect your Canada emergency money here, or click on this link to uh, because you've been approved for your benefit. These are scams, okay? Um, the way it'll work with CERB, once you've completed the information, you should get your payment right away. And it needs to be that only official uh, communications. If you are in doubt at all, please call our office and, and check it out. But don't click on any links that some, no CRA or Service Canada is not gonna send you a text with a link to tell you to get to pick up your money. So please don't do that. So um, we're going to go to uh, questions now, and I see that uh, in my in the chat room here, Curtis has been busy getting some of these questions uh, set up for me. And before we get to that, we we had one that was sent to us in advance, and this was a question from Larry, and he's asking what uh, what our party and what is happening in terms of support for seniors? Are, are we as a party doing anything to encourage the government, the Liberal government to help seniors? Um, he notes that uh, the, the government, the Liberals announced uh, an improvement to the old age security for people 75 and over. Um, we haven't had a budget yet, so that hasn't happened, uh, but that was an election promise of theirs to be fair. Um, so what is happening for seniors? At this point, the only programs under uh, COVID-19 programs that are there specifically for seniors and, and or frankly anyone who's in a lower income category, a fixed income, if you get the GST credit, uh, if you're eligible for that because of your income, you, in April you will have gotten a, a doubling up of that GST credit to a maximum of $400 for single and $600 for couples. That's already happened. Uh, there's nothing else really on the horizon that we can see, Larry, uh, that's specific to seniors. Uh, for pensioners, the people who have private pensions, they will have um, been able to not take the full uh, minimum withdrawal from their registered income fund. Uh, so when the markets are down so bad, it's a real disadvantage if members that if, if you if you're a pensioner and you have to take a certain amount of money out of your pension plan and the value of that pension plan is really down because the markets are down uh, it's a it's a it's penalizes those investors so they're able to reduce the amount of that minimum withdrawal by 25 percent that's the only other measure currently um, that has uh, been announced by the government our party and other opposition parties are pressing them to do more here and to work with the provinces to get more supports for people in long-term care a critical part of our service to the elderly and people who have frailty uh, and are particularly vulnerable to uh, COVID-19. So um, thanks for that, Larry. I know you've got a couple of other questions there, and if there's time at the end, uh, we'll get back to those as well. Now, let me just uh, go to uh, Curtis, and our first one up is from Shona, and she's asking, when will we have confirmation of approval for our Canada Summer Jobs funding? Uh, I'm just going to swing over to Curtis at this point. I don't know if we've, we don't, we never really know actually, Shona, exactly when that's going to happen. Curtis, have we heard anything from Service Canada on that? 
we were told by Service Canada that uh, we would be getting a list of approved projects today. Um, okay. That has not come through as of yet, but that's not unexpected. Service Canada is currently undergoing um, a follow-up with all applicants to determine if they are still interested in applying, just to make sure that uh, they're making sure that all of the funding goes to businesses and organizations that uh, will be hiring students in the time of head. So hopefully we'll hear something either later today or potentially tomorrow by the end of the week. Great question. And, and as I say, Shona, quite often we're, we find out about the same time as you do. So uh, I know it's in the works and will be uh, announced uh, very soon. Um, we're expecting that because some of the applicants may not be operating, that there may even be some extra money uh, in the program this year, but we'll wait and see uh, how that goes. Um, the next question, Tracy asks, I have a question uh, concerning the uh, possible requirements with um, regards to PPE needed for hairstylists. As a small business owner, I'm finding it very hard to access these materials. So Tracy, um, uh, give us a ring uh, at the office that we, we mentioned on last week's show. And uh, this is, and you're not alone in this, by the way. There are a lot of small businesses and, and you've, you've seen probably the province of Ontario has announced a kind of a phase schedule for small businesses starting to reopen. I think, uh, I forget the phase number that um, barbershops and hairstylists and so on would be able to start again. Thank goodness they will. We're all sporting these COVID-19 hairstyles these days and it's wonderful. But uh, yes, we're all happy to get back to the people who keep our hair looking good. So uh, look, um, I what I, I'd recommend is that you... Uh, contact your supplier for uh, typical suppliers that would serve the uh, for chemicals for cleaning supplies. Uh, any of your organizations where you'd normally find that, those would be good ones to uh, uh, speak with, depending on what it is that you need. Uh, give our office a call. We, In fact, I think this week we put some uh, suggestions up on our Facebook and on the website that will give you some ideas of, of where to, if you need masks, for example, where you can go to get those. I think suppliers are gradually uh, coming on stream in bigger numbers to make sure here in Canada we have sufficient PPE. Uh, but give us a ring and we'd be happy to help you with that and do what we can to uh, connect you with uh, some suppliers for that. Uh, next question, Rob is asking, is there an update on the Champlain Monument? Uh, so Rob, I, I think you're you're referring to uh, Parks Canada's um, uh, decision around what that monument uh, is going, what it's, it's being repatriated back to uh, Kuchiching Park, certainly. Uh, the last information I had, and of course, and I, I should as a piece of background information here, all parks and historic sites are currently closed until further notice. Um, my hunch is that Parks Canada, other than its um, essential works like uh, in the Trent Severn Waterway in terms of water management and those kinds of things, the park operations are closed. So um, the plan was to have the, the base for the Champlain Monument back in place by this time. Uh, and had COVID-19 not come upon us, I would, the, the plan would have been to have that more or less up and ready for the summer months. So that's the last information we have on that. Um, if you want to send us a note, even by email, Rob, we'll, uh, we'll be happy to check further on that for you. Oscars Variety, the good folks at Oscars Variety asked, do we foresee legislation making it mandatory for all employees to wear uh, PPE, uh, personal uh, protective equipment, in order to remain uh, open or working? So for Oscars Variety and, and others benefit, the uh, province of Ontario, like 95% of all workplaces in the province, the health and safety requirements for your workplace are, are governed uh, under the jurisdiction of the province. The other 5% is federal. There are some federal workplaces that uh, only the federal labor laws apply. So it's a pretty small wedge of the overall employment. Um, the government of Ontario has recently, I'm told, um, given out a, a set of guidelines on, on what that looks like, but you as an employer will be obliged to follow those requirements to make sure your employees can be safe. And so um, 
we again we can get you the contact information on that uh, but the province of ontario will be issuing um, guidelines around what you need to do as an employer to make sure uh, your uh, workplace is safe. As a second thought, uh, the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit is also a good point of contact for that kind of advice. Um, we have a, a comment um, on one of the points we removed. Uh, people who make less on a CERB than they would have on EI. So <clears throat> here's a good point. Um, the, what will happen there, if you were collecting EI, you're, it's a, a, an expectant mom who had been collecting EI and now have to switch over to CERB, and you were making uh, less, um, people who make less on CERB. So if you were making more on EI and, and are now being converted to CERB, in other words, seeing your weekly or monthly uh, or every four week period amount go down, um, you will not be clawed back on any of the amounts that you've already received. But going forward, you will be at the $500 a week or 2000 for every four weeks, and you'll stay on that until the end of the uh, CERB uh, period, the end of the 16 weeks, at which point, uh, if you're still uh, eligible for EI, you would swing back over to EI at that time. So I hope that answers the questions. Uh, if, you're, if you're supposed to be on CERB, you will be on that amount. But if you, at this point, you've already been overpaid some of that, you keep that. It won't be clawed back, um, but you will be going forward. You'll be on the $500 a week. A comment. Uh, thank you for that. Um, a comment. Uh, Haley said uh, her husband lost $300 a month by being switched uh, from EI to CERB. So it sounds like that's a similar situation. If a, if a person had been had been eligible on EI. Uh, and was getting those payments, but then switched, uh, they will be swing, swung over to the CERB benefit up to a maximum of 16 weeks. After that, it, it will be, um, it will be uh, going back to regular EI or in the case of expectant mothers, after uh, their baby is born, uh, they'll be on uh, maternity or paternal benefits. But uh, if there's a difference on that in terms of the EI, and one thing to keep in mind is they people can still earn up to $1,000 uh, per month, um, you know, $250 a week and even some part-time or other earnings, you can have that without doing, making any consequences in terms of your CERB benefit. So don't know what much more I can and tell you with that, but it is just the way the rules have, uh, have rolled out and uh, perhaps look at some options where you might be able to uh, benefit from those additional earnings. Uh, and another question Dawn is asking, in terms of businesses and other things reopening, uh, where will we find the rules for health sanitization and other critical factors uh, so that businesses can safely reopen? Uh, again, similar to the question from Oscar's Variety, uh, and I, I think we're all in agreement that nothing better than seeing uh, we're on a we're on a pace now. We've we've seen the peak of infections certainly, and uh, those are starting to come down on a daily basis now. Premier Ford here in Ontario has kind of put the province on a track now that we'll see the gradual reopening of businesses. But um, we're, we're absolutely right here. Don and others are right. We have to make sure we don't have a, a re-emergence of this uh, virus. So we've got to take the proper modifications and protections, not of our workers, not just of our workers, but our customers and all the people with whom we're interacting. So having that equipment in place, the province of Ontario will issue the guidelines for that. And I would recommend the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit for recommendations around the best way to make sure, you know, your, your practices and uh, any of the, the steps that you put in place to make sure your office is, um, is, is a safe place to work, office and or your, your business or retail store as the case may be. Uh, all of the things that we do uh, will be very helpful in uh, making sure we don't have a second or third wave of uh, COVID-19. So that's all the questions we have on, on COVID-19 for this evening so far. So let me swing back over to uh, one of uh, Larry's questions. 
Um, now he had a uh, members uh, or uh, members people on the call this evening may uh, recall that there uh, earlier I think it was um, I think it was early this week the days all kind of meld together here recently uh, but what we the government announced uh, a fairly broad spread uh, prohibition on a large number of uh, firearms models um, that people had acquired legally and now are uh, on a prohibition list. Um, so the, the question Larry has is, uh, is, is what is our party going to do, uh, if anything, to roll back uh, this uh, prohibition? And um, he, he mentions, for example, that he's a, a hunter safety instructor and finds that this is going to be um, a real imposition to people who are hunters. So <clears throat> let me just say a few things on this. Uh, on the prohibition itself, uh, it was done by regulation, Larry, so it didn't require any parliamentary action on this. Um, the, fire, the current Firearms Act allows the minister to reclassify firearms in whatever category he wishes. In this case, the uh, 1,500-odd models were reclassified in a lot of cases from the non-restricted class to prohibited, and in some cases in the restricted class to prohibited. It means that these uh, guns can't be bought or sold or or exported or imported, um, and they can only be transported in very limited um, uh, limited circumstances. Uh, the government has announced that there will be a two-year amnesty in place for so people who currently own these uh, firearms are are uh, saved of any you know they're all prohibited right now, but yet they're in their possession, so uh, they won't be facing any sort of criminal liability at least for the next two years until they can come into compliance. And the government has said there will be a, a period of uh, grand, there will be a, a regime or a system of grandfathering uh, these firearms in one case, and secondly, uh, some kind of buyback um, system where if uh, owners of these firearms wish to, they can uh, turn them in and uh, get a fair value for them. Uh, that, those last two things, the grandfathering and the and the system of uh, purchase back, uh, will have to go through Parliament. So we'll have to see legislation on that. In the meantime, uh, nobody's uh, at this point in possession of of uh, illegal firearms or prohibited. Uh, they have a period of time, uh, but they cannot be using them either. So uh, they'll have to be uh, put away. As to our party, Larry, we. Uh, this is all fairly new. The party hasn't come out with a specific uh, policy yet uh, in terms of, you know, a notion around a repeal or what would we do differently. Uh, but I can tell you after the election of last fall, um, our approach to this was certainly to make sure that we do everything we can in, in the area of public safety. But for us, uh, that meant, uh, you know, coming to terms with the uh, criminality uh, that's already occurring in the uh, trafficking of firearms. Uh, quite often, these are, you know, those major revenue centers for crime syndicates and others. Uh, there's also an awful lot of the uh, the crimes. Well, if not, you know, statistics show that far and away the majority of crimes. Uh, that are committed with firearms are already illegal. So uh, the, uh, the the imposition of new prohibitions uh, may not, I fear, really have as much a consequence on the illegal use of firearms and the criminal use of firearms as the government may think. Um, and that's an issue. We, we think we need to stop illegal guns from coming in across the border. So um, I, hope, I hope that's helpful. I know it was a long explanation for uh, a very important uh, topic for people here in Simcoe North, uh, that is for sure. Um, I've got another question here from Tracy. Um, is there any talk that CERB will continue if we're forced to stay closed after 16 weeks? It's a, that's Tracy, that's an exceptionally good question. Um, we, the government has kind of taken the position that nothing is off the table. Uh, they're prepared to do what they need to do to help people get through this period with uh, COVID-19. Um, we've also seen, though, where the economy is starting to reopen. And if we do it gradually and uh, do it in a, in a progression that allows people to be safe, um, a steady 
kind of opening of the economy. We'll avoid a second wave. We make sure we won't overwhelm our healthcare system. That's that's exactly where we need to be. Uh, but as to whether there will be an extension after the 16 weeks, we'll have to wait. Um, the the people who got on CERB right from the get-go in March 15th, they have benefits in place right through until the around the 10th of July. So we'll we're about a month away from you know we'll see where we sit a month from now in early June, uh, and we might have a better handle on whether. Uh, CERB is going to have to be uh, continued, but that will rest with the government. And uh, we'd be happy to hear as we get closer to that time, we'll be happy to hear your thoughts that we can forward to the government for their consideration. Um, and a comment, Barb uh, said, uh, today the government announced a combined pay raise uh, for essential workers. Uh, yes, we had, Barbara, we had seen, uh, had some inkling that that was coming. I know that the government of Ontario um, had introduced a pen, what they call a pandemic pay, and the federal government also uh, announced where any essential worker that was getting less than $2,500 a month in regular pay and working in an essential occupation, uh, that they, the federal government uh, would provide upwards of $1,000 uh, per month as a top up, if you will, uh, for that important work that they were doing. So we're, uh, the details in terms of what occupations are eligible, what, what's considered essential worker for this program, um, is with the province of Ontario. So we'll need to see what the province says about which occupations are eligible for that. Um, and continuing from a previous question, um, private companies are requiring uh, the senior to pay the uh, $4 per hour as they do not qualify for government funding of $4. Is the government going to address these extra charges being passed on to the senior? Um, I'm not sure. Um, Private companies are requiring the senior to pay. So, I, I'm not sure if that is that pertaining to. I'm going to I'm going to throw this back to Curtis to see if he has any further thoughts on what that might be. Um, what, yeah, what I'm, issue I'm, or program that? I think that it is in relation to, to the uh, combined pay for essential workers. Um, Barbara, if you want to reach out to us, we can look into it a little further because mm -hmm. uh, with the details just being released now, we're going to have to get familiar with those. Uh, but we can definitely follow up on that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it looks like it's fairly new, Barbara. So uh, yeah, let us let us get some details on that, and we'd be happy to get back to you uh, through uh, Facebook comments. Um, and then we've got another question from Tim. I know we're getting close to the end here, but uh, we'll take another question from Tim. Uh, has there uh, been any discussion about changes to the CR? That's the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance program specifically with regards to eviction protection for tenants. Okay, so the uh, rent assistance program has come under some considerable criticism uh, for on a couple of fronts, Tim. One is that the discretion with the uh, CECRA uh, rests entirely with uh, landlords. And so we're we're still some days away until we see CMHC actually come out with the uh, details and so that people can actually get on and apply for this rent assistance program. But what's clear is that unless you uh, are completely closed and or uh, had seen uh, more than a 70% drop in business, um, you're not going to qualify. And then it, you have to rely on your landlord to be willing to enter into an agreement with you on this um, rent sharing program. Um, you will know that it, it allows up to 50% of the what would normally be the rent going to the landlord um, would be given to the landlord as a loan. The landlord has to agree to give up 25% of the normal rents he would get from you as a business, and you still have to put in 25%. So it's uh, it, what, as a, what was thought initially as a pretty solid program is turning out to not being able to apply uh, as well as, as people had hoped. So our party and others are, are sort of bringing these issues to the government. Uh, I, I will say that they are listening, but they haven't announced anything in the form of changes. On the eviction question, 
the uh, the in, if a C if a rental assistance program does go ahead, the landlord must agree to no convictions as a condition for that uh, particular agreement. Uh, so the hope is that people will use it, um, but it does seem that um, it it will have limits in terms of how much it can help you, uh, because uh, many businesses at least are doing. They've made some incredible entrepreneurs and business leaders in our area. They're so good at adapting to new circumstances, and many of them have have done what they need to do to try and uh, modify their operations in such a way that they can still have some income coming in. Uh, but for those who can't, um, this is something that they should still at least look at. And if they're on good terms with their landlord, I think it's a great way to go. Um, and I think that's about it for questions. So look, I, I want to um, uh, uh, thank you all, first of all, for, for coming and joining me again tonight on on the, the very much uh, the, the details around this uh, critical program, uh, the CERB uh, benefit. I, I want to um, uh, just recall that we're, our offices are here to serve you. <clears throat> We've even been doing our own Zoom calls as of late. We, uh, as a as a group, we you know we've got people working in offices in Midland and in Aurelia. Um, but in order for all of us to sort of make sure we're on the same page, we've got a staff member in Ottawa, some working from home. So we use uh, the Zoom technology to get together and make sure we're staying current on the issues that we need to uh, to serve you. And you have our, our contact information there is there, of course. You can contact us anytime. We're there Monday to Friday, uh, nine till four thirty. Uh, we will be. We won't be uh, on deck on the Monday of the long weekend, uh, but back right away on the Tuesday. Um, just a reminder that the Health Canada has a really good app uh, that you might want to download and use. It's a good resource for information. There's also a self-assessment tool there that uh, if you've got, you've got conditions and you think you might want to just check that out, um, a self-assessment tool is there to help. I want to use this uh, occasion as I've done each of our uh, four uh, broadcasts to uh, shout out to the amazing healthcare workers and the people on the front lines of helping our people in the community uh, deal with this uh, COVID-19 uh, risk. Uh, people in our hospitals, the nurses, the staff, the physicians, all of the people who lead and help uh, on our frontline healthcare teams, the personal support workers, the workers in our long-term healthcare and working in uh, in-home care. All of these are doing an amazing job to support the people here at home. And of course, I don't want to forget our first responders that are always there to help us in a whole range of needs uh, well outside of uh, COVID-19, but COVID-19 as well. Thanks to our crew here tonight. Um, our show comes to you uh, put together by uh, my, uh, the director of this program is uh, David Delrymple, and he, he does all of the uh, technical stuff behind the scenes. And uh, Curtis, uh, who you've seen on the call this evening, uh, is in the trenches every day working with uh, serving people on the uh, program, and, and but also you know, there to advise the staff on some of these really specific questions uh, responding to COVID-19. Now, I'm not going to be back next week. Uh, we have, uh, I'll be going up to Ottawa next Tuesday. Wednesday and Thursday, so I'm going to be uh, in in transport uh, on the highway uh, coming back on Thursday evening. So I won't be able to um, to get a, a Facebook Live uh, next week, but we're going to shoot for two weeks from now, the 21st of May. We'll be back here at seven o'clock on the 21st to give you an update on the things that have changed in the period of time uh, from today forward. And by that time, we'll probably have more details on some of these programs that we've discussed this evening. So I want you to uh, uh, have a uh, have a good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, more importantly, in the days ahead, I hope you all stay well and uh, and stay uh, with your stay at home, of course, as much as you can. Uh, I do hope, though, with the warmer weather that you'll be able to get outside and enjoy uh, some of the uh, at a safe distance, of course, uh, enjoy some of the outside weather that all of us need a little breath of uh, in the coming days. So stay well and stay in touch. Have a good night.